and the fact that I was able to present a biblical defense, they actually came away saying, well, you know, for one thing we learned about you old earth creationists, you really do have a biblical model uh, for the flood. So I showed my talk to Kathy afterwards and said, you put this together in just a couple of hours? Well, it was more than a couple of hours. Because uh, as soon as I found out about what Bill Dembski was going to do, I you know, immediately started working on it while the other guys were speaking and you know, pulled it together. Uh, but it's something I'll probably share with you one of these days, uh, because what I realize is within the Old Earth Creationist community, there really hasn't been uh, a thorough biblical presentation on why reading through the entire Bible makes it impossible to believe that the flood is global. And that's kind of what was the whole point of my talk, was to take them through all the passages in the Bible that deal with the flood. And, you know, their perspective is there's only two passages, Second Peter and Genesis 6 through 9. Well, I had a whole bunch more verses out of the Bible that dealt with the flood and uh, particularly concluded that there's no way you can interpret the Bible as supporting a global flood interpretation. But I did say that it supported uh, uh, a worldwide interpretation. And uh, the whole point of my talk was, is the flood worldwide or is it global? And, of course, they presume that they're one and the same. And I'm saying, no, from a biblical perspective, there's a difference between worldwide and global. I think we had a brief discussion on this in class a few months ago. Uh, but let me just show you where I ended up with this talk, because I discovered something new on the web while I was preparing this that um, I think uh, leads to a possibility for resolving this issue. And so I ended my talk with this whole point. Here's how we can gain some sense of resolution on this issue, is to say that we all believe in a worldwide flood. We believe the whole world of Noah was destroyed by a flood. And my whole point is, however you interpret the Bible, old earth or young earth, uh, we could all certainly agree on this. We may have different interpretations of what worldwide is, but I said, here's a statement that I think we could all sign. And then I went one step further, saying, okay, now that we've got that established, let's see if we can push this a little bit further. And my point was, there can be resolution if old earth creationists will be willing to expand their limits on Noah's flood, and if young earth creationists will be willing to shrink their limits on Noah's flood. So I'm saying, you know, I want you guys to pull your flood in a little bit. We'll expand ours a little bit, and let's see if we can meet somewhere in the middle. And... Uh, as a serious proposal on how we could proceed in this direction, I talked about a new model of a flood that I discovered uh, from a geologist's website. And the geologist's name is Ward Sanford. And uh, just literally weeks ago, he's come up with a new model uh, for the flood of Noah. So I just want to kind of show you what this model is. And uh, what he points out is that the flood of Noah must have occurred near the end of the last ice age. And indeed, that's the model we presented reasons to believe, that the date of Noah's flood is in the neighborhood of thirty to 40,000 years ago, which would place it uh, near the close of the last ice age. Well, the interesting thing about that is new evidence now tells us uh, that before the end of the last ice age, uh, the sea levels were a lot lower, and uh, you also had a lot of ice weighing down on the continents, which tended to push up the land areas uh, where you have narrow straits. And as such, you have the Hormez Straits uh, blocked at that time, and you'd have the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf being dry at the time of the end of the last ice age. And therefore, what Ward Sanford proposes is that the location for the Garden of Eden is in the middle of the Persian Gulf. It would have been dry at that time. Now, the interesting thing about that, it solves a lot of biblical problems about the flood as well as the Garden of Eden. Because what does the text tell us about the Garden of Eden? It talks about four rivers that flow out or from the Garden of Eden. The Tigris, the Euphrates, the Pishon, and the Gihon. Yes, Okay, Ward Sanford is a Ph.D. research geologist who is an evangelical Christian. He's a member of the American Scientific Affiliation, which is an organization of scientists who are willing to sign a doctrinal statement that they believe in a God 
Uh, that's all you have to say. I mean, so it has a huge range of uh, uh, scientists who believe in deism to theism to Christianity to whatever. But Ward Sanford is an evangelical research geologist, and uh, he's just put this up on the web as a proposal. And uh, he's not saying he's got anything proven. He says, I'm just simply proposing that this might be a way to resolve some of the geological difficulties we face in the first uh, nine chapters of Genesis. And uh, the point he makes here is that when, it, when you read in Genesis chapter 2, uh, it identifies three locations, Assyria, Havilah, and Cush. It says the Tigris and the Euphrates River flow out of Assyria and that the um, Pishon flows out of the land of Havilah, and the Gihon flows out of the land of Cush. Well, if you read throughout the Bible, uh, Cush is identified as Ethiopia, uh, so that would be this region down here. Uh, that's the land of Cush. And uh, then the land of Havilah, the text tells us, is a place uh, that is wealthy in uh, onyx and gold. Uh, well, for there to be lots of onyx, it has to be a relatively dry place. And uh, biblically speaking, the land of Havilah has been identified as the islands of the Saudian uh, Arabian Peninsula. This would be the land of Havilah. And so out of there flows the river Pishon, and then out of the land of Cush would flow the river Gihon, and Gihon, the Pishon, the Tigris, and the Euphrates would all meet in one place. Well, what he points out here, and here's just the locations. If you go into Genesis chapter 4, it also tells us that uh, uh, the land of Nod is to the east of Eden. I mean, uh, you've, you've got the story of uh, Cain and Abel, and uh, when Cain murdered his brother Abel, he was banished from the land of Eden, and it said he moved to the east and built a city in the east. Well, here you could have the land of Nod near the Hormuz Straits. Uh, the land of Havilah is identified as here. And what Ward Sanford's geological research has pointed out is that satellite photo imagery tells us that there's an ancient riverbed that flows out of the land of Havilah right through here, down along here, and into the Persian Gulf. And likewise, there's a riverbed, an ancient riverbed you can see that flows out of this part of Arabia down here and join up into this region. So he says it's the one location where he could have all four rivers uh, coming together. And uh, given that uh, the Persian Gulf was dry uh, near the end of the last ice age, uh, that could really work. And also we do know that the land of Havilah is a region that was famous for both its onyx and its gold. Uh, now, that would put the date of the flood at thirty to 40,000 years ago, but that's the date that we have already established through calibrating the Genesis 11 genealogy. Uh, I think a couple of our latest books, uh, Who is Adam and Creation of Science, uh, give the documentation for why you would have that date, uh, because you can determine historically the date for Abraham is 4,000 years ago, and then a text, text tells us that the world was divided in the days of Peleg, which we believe is a reference to the breaking of the Bering Land Bridge at the very end of the last ice age, and that's now been carbon-14 dated to be 14,000 years ago. And uh, with those two dates, 14 to 11,000 years ago, with those two dates, you can get a rough date for when Noah must have lived, and it would be right in line with what uh, Ward Sanford's model is explaining. Now, what I was sharing with the younger creationists there is that this particular model for the flood uh, would have a lot more water uh, covering land masses than is traditionally the case with an old earth interpretation of the flood. Because the traditional old earth view is that it's the Mesopotamian plain that was flooded uh, by the waters. But in this particular model, you'd have the Persian Gulf flooded, you'd have the Mesopotamian flooded, and you'd have this plain in here leading up to the land of Havilah and Cush, also being flooded. Bottom line is you wind up with a flood that's four times larger than the traditional old earth interpretation of the flood. So 
basic how I ended my talk is say, well, we're prepared to expand our flood model by a factor of four. How about if you guys shrink your model by a factor of four? And then maybe we've got something where we can actually build towards resolution. And making the point, too, that uh, in terms of this model that's been proposed by Ward Sanford, old earth creationists really have got nothing to lose in terms of their biblical interpretation of the flood from making the flood a little bit bigger. And likewise, young earth creationists have nothing to lose from adopting a smaller flood model. Both sides can endorse a worldwide flood. But the whole basis of my talk is what does the Bible say about worldwide, uh, making the point that it's quite different from what the young earth creationists interpret. I'll present that to you some other time. Uh, but actually, what I did during my seven uh, minutes of scientific evidence is point out that we do have unambiguous scientific ways of testing whether or not the flood was global in extent. And uh, particularly ice age cores and um, uh, deep marine sediment cores. It would be impossible to hide the evidence for a global flood from that core activity. So my whole point is, you know, by going with a little uh, smaller flood, they've got a lot to gain scientifically. And as far as our fossil evidence goes, um, you know, to try to claim that all the fossils were deposited by a global flood doesn't really solve their problem uh, because the fossils are far too abundant.